It's a privilege to be here as this is a conference looking to the future. And yet when I look at the demographic profile of those who are the other presenters, I can see that I'm well towards the top end. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very nice that you've invited an old codger, a blast from the past, uh, to give uh, a few reflections. Uh, because specifically, Hein asked me to look at something I did more or less exactly 20 years ago. Uh, more or less what, what I got wrong, which is quite a, a lot, but more or less to reflect on how I would do a particular map that appears in that book differently. I was somewhat reluctant to do this, as you will see, but I will do so using as a theme, a lens, if you like, of scale and level of analysis uh, to, to make this reinterpretation. But before I go on to more substantive issues, let me just introduce a story to which I will return at the very end of this presentation. I hope that this story il helps to illustrate what I want to say. And this story comes from a book by one of our finest travel writers, Robert McFarlane. And his book, The Old Ways, A Journey on Foot. In fact, some of the journeys he makes are not on foot at all, they're by boat. And one of those journeys by boat is in fact on a migrant superhighway of the Bronze Age, which is now to the west of mainland Scotland. And of course that migration superhighway linked together the main centres of dynamism of Northwestern Europe at that time. And what he says is that the sea, rather than a barrier, brings people together. It was the land that was the barrier. And we have to invert our normal understanding of Europe's geography to bring this about. And in his words, to bring about a radical reimagining of the history of Europe. I'm just going to leave that to one side and then come back to that right at the end of the presentation. All right, level and scales of analysis. Well, in terms of geographical scale, what we're essentially we're looking at the units of analysis, about the size of the spatial units that we use. And of course, by and large, as we saw yesterday, we use the state as the fundamental unit. And certainly the state is still the basic building block of the world we live in. More practically, it is the unit for which much of our data are compiled. Our indicators of human development, our GDP per capita, the number of immigrants, and if we're lucky, the number of immigrants. But we must never forget that huge differences within the state exist, and particularly if we're dealing with large states, such as India or China but even uh, in relatively smaller states, such as Thailand. Differences exist not just in terms of degree of development from one part of the state to the other, but in terms of to where immigrants go and from where immigrant, immigrants come. Migration is not randomly distributed across space. So while the aggregate data for states as a whole are useful, they must be used with a great deal of care, and particularly in interstate comparisons of migration-related data. Now, one of the major problems is dealing with the role of the city, and particularly the metropolis, because our data clearly show the importance of cities as destinations. We saw that yesterday. For example, inner and outer London together account for 36.6% of the 7.7 .7 million foreign born in the United Kingdom in 2012. Inner London alone, the foreign born represents fully 40% of the resident population. Similarly, the populations of New York and Los Angeles both had over one third of their populations foreign born in 2010 compared with only about 12% for the US as a whole. So it's quite clear that there are specific destinations for migration. They tend to be channeled towards big cities. Certainly there are branches all over, 
but the concentration of immigrants. Now, the, the data on emigration is much more problematic. We don't know what proportion of Nigerians in the United Kingdom come from Lagos, for example, or of Peruvians in London who are from Lima. We don't know these. We just don't have the data coded uh, to these uh, levels. And it's unlikely we will. But from the data that we have from micro-level surveys, we suspect that cities are, in fact, important origins of migration. Particularly if we're looking at highly skilled migration, simply because the institutions to create the highly skilled are concentrated in the largest cities. Now, I don't want to overplay that. Because if we are looking at the migration from Bangladesh to the UK or from Pakistan to the UK, the areas of origin are highly specific, but they are not from Karachi or from Dhaka. They are from fairly isolated parts of Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now, there are specific reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into, but we do have to be a little careful. But nevertheless, the point I'm trying to get across is that the origins and destination are highly controlled. They're highly the channels. And we're looking at inter interstate movements. This is useful, but it's not good enough, really. We have to focus in much more on subnational divisions to understand the dynamics of uh, migration. Now, let me just uh, touch the screen, right, and then press. There we go. All right, let me look at levels of analysis for a minute. Because I've looked at spatial units. Here, and I'm, I'm taking my cue from a recent book on, on warfare by um, Ian Morris. And he has divided the vast literature on, on war into four categories. And if ever the, there comes a time to write a historiography of migration, I think I will find those, or we will find those four levels are uh, quite useful. The first is, is, is personal. Stories of migration, of course, the parallel, the, the tales of soldiering on the front line. Then we have what I would call thick description, and uh, Morris calls military history, looking at the uh, accounts of, uh, by the um, men commanding uh, soldiers in the field. Then we get into the technical studies. Uh, the principles of war, principles of warfare. I think this is our migration and development models, many of the models we were looking at yesterday. And then lastly, we have evolution of deep structures. Transitions, historical mapping, global views. The deep structures, to where we're really lo looking down below for the underlying reasons that are not so intuitively obvious. What I'm going to be talking about uh, in, in, in this short address is really focused on, on four, though I'll occasionally go down uh, to, to three. If we're looking at the roles of structure and agency, that, and I've intrigued us, quite clearly agency is most prominent at the top and structure at the bottom. That doesn't mean to say that one is necessarily better than the other, not at all. But interestingly, Morris, in his discussion of the literature on war, um, it says that very few people master all four levels. I think it, what is important is we must be aware of these different levels. And those of us who work on four must be aware of, of the personal levels. My approach to migration and development has been very different from much of the recent discourse, which has seen uh, migration almost as a tool to bring about development. I saw migration as one spatial expression of an economic, social, and political system. And when that system changes, develops, um, we expect a shift in the volume and patterns of migration and composition of migration. In this view, migration is neither good nor bad, but simply an integral part of the whole process of development. It's, a, it's the model that I conceptualized was a transition model, certainly, a constantly shifting system, but one that diffused horizontally across space and vertically down through a social hierarchy that is reflected in the settlement hierarchy. Now, the idea of a demographic transition has been with us for a long time. I think the best recent summary is by Tim Dyson at LSE. And it's been an important part, central part, 
of the population literature. And quite clearly, our discussions of migration um, have looked, have tried to link migration with changes in fertility and mortality. Now, what I want to show here, trying to illustrate what I was talking about a few minutes ago, is the importance of subnational units. Very rarely do we have the data to look at changes in something as unique as fertility. And here we have, and I'll show you two periods. This is the, uh, the first half of the 1970s, and uh, the next map is the second half of the 1970s. That's this one. And what we have is a moving frontier of fertility decline. And so the idea then is a critical question. is whether migration, as the third of the demographic variables, in fact follows a systematic sequence of change that spreads across space, in a rather like this does for fertility. Now, Zelinsky, uh, in his famous 1971 paper, did try to do that. I never tried to do that. I wasn't as ambitious. I didn't try to link... Uh, these variables together, but what I did try to do is to show how migration systematically changed. Migration on its own, the spatial pattern of migration, systematically changed over time. Now, the map that uh, Hein wanted me to look at had an antecedent, and this was it. Uh, it was developed um, about 25 years ago, just looking at Asia, where I did develop these five Tears. Now, I'll come on to these in a minute, but this is Asia-specific. And I was interested specifically at that time in uh, really Taiwan and, and, and Korea, which you can see, uh, here's Korea. And you can see that Korea at that time I classified as a core extension. It wasn't really part of the core of Asia. And what we tried to do is to link that with other kinds of transitions. And this mass of numbering, it really is quite simple, uh, or, or lettering, it shows the evolution of industries from infant to becoming um, competitive to becoming self-sustaining as these uh, go across the matrix. And, and when we're looking at, uh, we had a lot of discussion of policy yesterday, and it was fi a fixed on migration policy. What we must forget is that so many of the policies that are going to ultimately impact on our migration will be industrialization policy, trade policies, uh, population policies in general, foreign policy. You cannot understand what's going on in Korea without its links to uh, the United States and without its geopolitical context between uh, uh, the largest communist country in the world at that, uh, at, and, of course, its links with the West. And this is the map that I developed, um, extending it globally, and this is the one Hein wants me to look at. And, and I was very reluctant, really, to generate an updated version because I think there are problems with it. So what's wrong? First and foremost, what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, the lines between these different development, migration development regions, the lines give the idea of clear separation between the regions, of fixed boundaries. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. The lines are porous. I emphasized just a few minutes ago that the diffusion of any transition is both horizontal and vertical. Hence, one expects boundaries to jump ahead, controlled by, perhaps by the distribution of elite groups in a complex urban hierarchy before it diffuses down to the majority of members in any population. Hence, the real differences between the five tiers uh, sketched in the map are rather, these are rather notional. Secondly, and even more importantly, and uh, related to the earlier point of using states as units, what I've done here is just replace states with regions, uh, which is really good enough. And the tiers themselves are not simply homogeneous. And I'm going to try and look at this in the second part of this presentation, a little bit more detail, uh, to try and get across the differences within uh, the core regions as well as the other end of the spectrum, the resource, uh, the resource niche. But it's assumed that in core and new core areas that states have effective control over the territories to which they make claims. So the state is still there. Now, this is not always the case, but by and large, it is. And at the other end of the spectrum, in the resource needs, uh, control of governments over space is not nearly uh, so, so strong. Um, in emphasizing this aspect, I'd just like to 
flag up a footnote that in our discussions of migration and development over the last 15 years, in fact, it's the migration and political development have received what in Scotland we would call very short shrift. And that is that we haven't given migration and political uh, development really the attention it deserves. But I'll just leave that uh, on one side because I think it's another story. But let's see the mobility characteristics of these main tiers. And, in, and, and here I'm going to put the new core and the old core together. I don't have time to develop the reasons of why there are different paths through this transition. Now, in, in, in these cores, internal migration is declining. It's mainly intra- and inter-urban as they've become highly urbanised societies. International migration is highly variable, as we will see. Often within the cores, although it is being overtaken by high levels of shorter-term mobility, and I'll try and justify that a little later on. In the core extensions and potential cores, we have rapid urbanisation, with pronounced rural-to-urban migration and urban-to-urban -urban movements up the urban hierarchy. The international migration is primarily from the labour frontiers and um, to the old and new cores. The labour frontier, of course, is the main regions of supply of labour. Uh, internally, there's rural to urban migration within the tier, but interna internal migration is still dominated by rural to rural movements. But we've got significant international migration, circular and longer term, to both core extensions, potential cores, and some core tiers. And then the regions of refuge or the resource niche, um, I vary between those two terms, with complex patterns of rural, to, uh, rural circulation and this resistance to the incorporation into other tiers. This is a, 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 it's, it's interesting because it doesn't want to be incorporated and it actively resists it or, or through confrontation or by retreat. There are large numbers of forcibly displaced. All right. So, here is my modified map, anticlimax though it might seem. So let me just go on a Cook's tour um, through this. Uh, starting in Asia, I extended the course down here through Vietnam. Quite clearly Vietnam has been transformed since I wrote this book in the mid-1990s. I've included Indonesia. If anyone's looked at the book, you will see that there's a discussion of Indonesia, and I, sent, I decided to leave it in the... In the uh, Labour frontier in the mid-90s, unquestionably that you'd have to put it into the expanding core. Now, uh, given its transition to, to fairly stable government, passing one government to the next, and also that by 2050 we estimate that Indonesia will probably be round about the 10th largest economy in the world. This is a very significant economy moving rapidly. Um, in the mid-1990s, we've had the, just had the implosion of the Soviet Union, and I didn't really know what to make of this. What we'd have to put now is the expansion of the labour frontier here uh, in, into Central Asia. Possibly it was through my own ignorance at that time that I just put it within the resource niche, but there would have to be uh, major changes there. And you can see the expansion of these labour frontiers, this is in purple, uh, in various parts of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and, and up, up, up here. You will see the expansion of core areas. I've just uh, put them in the Ethiopia, one of the fastest growing economies in the world uh, in the early 21st century. Uh, sometimes this is these, um, uh, the colours are a little displaced. It was just the program I was using. And so you have to be very careful. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a core area down the Cayo and the Wailas here in Peru. It's actually supposed to be along the coast, but that's just the way it was done. Most controversially, I think, and that's here, and speculatively, I'm putting here a potential core over Iran and stretching down, covering the, uh, the, uh, the Shia Iran into the Sunni uh, Gulf. Now, this is highly speculative, but I do that because of the, uh, the isolation of Iran of uh, the last 30 years and being brought back, I think, now into the global community. But a country that's, that's gone through an astonishing fertility transition to levels of fertility that we're familiar with in Eastern Asia and Europe, and that it's importing labour. Refugees! Through like tens of thousands of refugees from Afghanistan, classified as refugees, but de facto drawn into the Iranian labour force. If I was a young researcher starting out to look at migration today, I'd want to look at this. It's not that it's going to happen tomorrow, or even next year, but it's an area that I think we need to look at as one of potential future dynamism and geopolitical importance. 
and you'll see I put a little bit of green in there. That was a big mistake I made uh, because I missed that bit of the uh, of the resource niche moving south. But let me let, let, let me move on because uh, I think if we're simplifying it, it what this what the map shows is the areas of most interest are next to the uh, the old core areas. Here we, we transition from uh, emigration to immigration, Mexico. Uh, and I'm sure Doug will may talk about this tomorrow, uh, to, to close to net migration, if not already that it's uh, net migration zero, uh, drawing migrants from, from Central Asia, so, so Central America, beg your pardon, here, North and, Northern Africa, the, the flows to the Netherlands from, from Morocco, by Eng in study by Engelson, and he showed how they've slowed, uh, drawing in migrants from, from further south. And so, so these areas are extremely interesting in the expansion of, of core areas. Now, let me just move on, and there's a massive figure here, but let me just, I want to just pick out a, 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 one, two columns. I want to look at the differences within core areas. And I talked, when I characterized the mobility, I, I talked about the decline in internal migration. And this, in this table shows almost a collapse of internal migration in Japan and Korea. Um, so it's, it's, these figures, it's these columns here you want to look at. Uh, this is the number of intra-local migrants in, in, in Japan from 1970 through to uh, 2010. And you can see that they haven't quite halved, but they have declined markedly. These are interprefectural um, migrants done from the, re the, the registration systems. So the annual numbers of internal migrants has, has, has collapsed. Korea is about 10 years behind. It's still, they're still increasing up until 1990, and then you've got a very marked decline, uh, particularly uh, here. So there's a, de a, a decrease in, in the number of internal migrants in these core countries. Uh, it's associated with the changing demography uh, of Japan. You can see Japan by 2050 is well on its way to what demographers love to call the coffin shape of a dying population. And, and, and here, these black areas are the areas of severe de depopulation. And I'll come to that in a very different con uh, context in, in a few minutes. Um, because it's not all about demography. Um, here's the United States, annual domestic migration rates. Uh, it's a, in an, from an article by Bill Frey. And he's looked at a long-term secular decline in internal migration in the United States. And in recent work that Martin Bell of the University of Queensland has carried out, this, this is typical of uh, of the United Kingdom and, and, and Australia. The decline in, in the number of internal migrants. Now, it may be as they become more highly urbanized that the differences between urban regions have become less, so there's no need to move. So it's not all about demography. Uh, the patterns of house ownership are changing. Uh, so there are a lot of factors we've got to look to put into the mix. But the interesting thing is that internal migration is slowing. Now, what of international migration? Now, if we look at Japan, in fact, international migration too is declining, at least according to official statistics. Um, well, what about the United States, Canada, and Australia? Here we have a, these three uh, settler societies, Australia, Canada, the United States. And the top line, these are the number of migrants, people going to Australia as immigrants. Uh, 2010 to 2012, 168,000, 185,000. Canada, landed immigrants, 280,000, 248, 257. United States, it's just about, just over a million. Now, so far so good, but let's look at those who go in with temporary worker visas. And these are those who have temporary worker visas and the families. No, they're not all just temporary entrants. These are the ones going in as workers, plus the families. At least they are for the United States. I just can't remember what, what presented here. 349,307, 340,000. In other words, the numbers going in is almost double the size of the number of, of so called permanent migrants. Because we know, particularly if you look at the ethnic Chinese, that many of those going in as, as temporary, as, as permanent migrants, circulate. But Bob Biro many years ago said if you want to understand migration to the settler societies, don't look at the immigration statistics. Look at the temporary entrance. I think the United States, very interestingly, here you've got a number of temporary workers and their families, uh, 2.8 million, 3.4 million, 3 million, and then here are students, 1.6 million, 1.8, and so on. So they are, you know, they, they, if you only look at the immigrants, 
those who are defined as immigrants, we have, uh, you know, we don't, we're, we're losing sight of what goes on. I'm not going to have time to look, of course, this is just for the US, these are total admissions. Of course, these are, these are entries, these are not people, these are entries and they include tourists. But it's just to show you the, the, um, how it fits in that context. I'm not going to have time to look at, um, at, 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 at tourists um, or, or rather other short-term entrants. Uh, this is Hong Kong. I just want to draw attention to the, um, the importance of, of a turnover of Hong Kong's, the number of recent arrivals. These are both, this is the 2001 census and the 2011 census. And there's a churning at the bottom. A, a, a number of recent uh, uh, migrants coming in and others going out. There's a very stable expatriate core because the, dip, the pattern between Chinese and non-Chinese populations are very clear. There is a stable expatriate core, but you've got a churn of recent acts, people coming for one, two, three, four years, and then going. Coming, and many of them moving through the networks of multinational corporations. So you've got this churning. But it's not all about higher mobility. Oops, let me just leave it there. It's not all about higher mobility because quite clear there are people left behind. And if I can think, taking one region uh, quite close to London, in fact, um, let me just get the, uh, it's become infamous because it's likely to provide the first UKIP uh, member of parliament in the United Kingdom, the uh, constituency of Clacton. Now, Clacton in the UK contains the second oldest population in the country, as far as the proportion of six, over 65 is concerned. It is the second lowest proportion of 25 to 44 year olds in the country. It's cons the constituency also is amongst the lowest proportion of foreign passport holders in the UK. And in fact, uh, as one might expect, given its age structure, over one quarter of its residents have no UK passport. Only 13% of the population had higher level qualifications uh, compared to the UK average of 27%. In other words, this is a residual population, a population left behind. So it's not all about high mobility. This it would be equivalent to the areas in black in Japan. It, residual populations. Now, just a very quick word, and it has to be a very quick word, on the resource nature of the regions of refuge. These are people who are actively resisting incorporation into the global, into this wider global system. Sometimes through violence, but sometimes just through withdrawing. This is the idea of, of James Scott's, the art of not being governed. And that's where I made that mistake. I should have had that um, area in Southeast Asia, uh, Zomia, according to Scott, uh, where there are people resisting incorporation into Vietnam, southern China, uh, into China uh, and Thailand and so on. I've been taking my students to northern Vietnam for the last 12 years and the terraces are moving up the valleys as the state sedentarizes the hill tribe groups and minority groups and incorporates them into society. But there's a, a lot of interesting things going on here at the margins. Now, finally, finally, just let me come to where I, point where I started. McFarland's idea of superhighway of the Bronze, uh, bronze Age that is now a backwater. Now, I tried to, re um, try to reconceptualize uh, 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 migration in terms of transitional and diffusion system. There are many ways of, of, of conceptualizing one, and right at this university, and that is now Professor Danny Darling, has uh, really reconceptualized the way we think about so much, so, so much about the world in terms of these maps. Here we've got the number of emigrants, uh, international uh, migrants, by place of origin, countries of origin, by their size, uh, and by uh, immigrants. Now, very, very useful, but here we still have, we still have North America over on the left-hand side, Europe and Africa in the middle, and Asia on the right-hand side. One of the challenges that's going to face us in terms of development and in terms of future migration is going to be uh, global climatic change. Uh, I don't want to be too dramatic about this, but the point I, I, I want to try and get, get a across is that the world will be very different and maybe we need to start looking at the world from a different point of view and I would introduce this map which will seem a major jumble it's an old map and I couldn't find a more recent one but here's the Arctic this is an Arctic centered map 
So that if the, uh, the ice cap now is up at 81 degrees uh, a couple of years ago, and which is uh, one of the smallest areas of sea ice that, uh, that we've experienced uh, in the Arctic, and if that's going to be clear, then some of the future ways, the new ways, as opposed to McFarland's old ways, may be round here. And the resultant core and new core and areas that will evolve will be somewhat different. But perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, that is a pe speculation too far, and I'll end there.